Thank you, Yun, and uh, good morning, everybody. And, uh, and I would like to start by thanking the organizers, uh, Yun, Cecilia, and uh, Carol, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here and in this meeting. So, so I, I realize that most of you are probably mathematicians and very few physicists around. So, so this is a talk about physics. physics uh, so I'll try to explain to you as much as I can. And uh, so, so the, the main problem that I'm going to talk about, the system is very, very simple. It's uh, just a free non-interacting fermions, n of them, in a harmonic trap in 1D at zero temperature. You know, it's a probably the simplest example of a quantum many body system. And we would like to sort of uh, uh, study two observables. So one is this number variance, uh, and the other is the entanglement entropy. And I define uh, exactly as I go along. And so we have been working on this uh, fermionic system for a while now. And uh, how, do, how do I go forward? So uh, with various collaborators, uh, Pasquale Calabresi, David Dean, Pierre Ledusal, uh, Ricardo Marino, who was a PhD student, Gregory Scher, and Pierre Paolo Vivo. And uh, so some results are published in these papers. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today particularly has to do with this PhD thesis of uh, Ricardo Marino, at least part of it, on the number variance. And uh, so Ricardo was, he did his PhD at LPTMS with me, and then uh, he was a postdoc at uh, Wiseman, and uh, now he has joined a big data company in Paris. So, a loss for physics. So, anyway, so here is the outline of my talk. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about, as I said, the system is very, very simple. In spinless interacting fermions in a 1D harmonic trap at zero temperature, okay, ground state. That's the simplest, sim simplest system. And uh, so, what I'm going to do, talk about is the just, you know, take a subsystem around the trap center, say minus L to plus L. And, uh, and given this interval, we want to look at two observables. So the first one is the number variance. That means how many fermions are there in this sub-interval minus L to plus L. Okay? Now this number, even though the system is at ground state, because of quantum fluctuations, the fermion position still fluctuate. So as a result, this number, this very number of fermions inside this sub-interval minus L to plus L also fluctuate even at zero temperature, and we want to know what is the fluctuation, what is the number variance of this. So that's the first observable. And the second observable is this entanglement entropy of this subsystem minus L to plus L with the rest of the system. And I'll generally consider the Rainy entropy, which is defined by this parameter Q. So this is just a log trace of the, uh, so you take the de full density matrix of the system, and then you look at the reduced density matrix of the subsystem A. And then we look at the trace of rho a to the power q. So when the limit q goes to 1, it reduces to usual von Neumann entropy. So these are the two observables. Now, in general, they are not related to each other. But we'll see that in some regime, in this problem at least, they get related to each other, which is very nice, because entanglement entropy is something that is not easy to measure experimentally, and uh, whereas number variance is something that is easy. And so the relation between them helps to measure the entanglement entropy. So that's the main point. And uh, so, to, so the main question that I'll ask is that as I vary this system, you know, the subsystem minus L, this system size L, by keeping the number of fermions N fixed, so how do these two observables change as a function of L? Okay. So that's, that's the main question I want to ask. And what we'll see is that there is a one-to-one -one mapping to, uh, to a random matrix theory problem of the Gaussian unitary ensemble uh, between these fermions and uh, GUE. And uh, this mapping actually helps us to obtain exact results for large n with fixed L. Okay, so that's the sort of main, main point. And uh, so I'll discuss in detail this mapping to RMT. And uh, finally, I'll just uh, summarize and conclude with some open problems. Okay, so let's start. So as you know that you know the, in the recent days there have been spectacular progress in the in the experimental progress in the cold atom systems. Uh, this is the main motivation for this work, and uh, so basically these guys you know these experimentalists they can do amazing things. You know they can tune the interaction between the atoms, they can tune the temperature, and uh, so they can probe the uh, sort of quantum and statistical fluctuations in many body systems at low temperature very easily, and uh, using laser traps by for confining the fermions in a, you know, or bosons in a finite uh, region of space. And uh, as a result, it can probe interesting quantum many-body effects 
even in the absence of interaction. As I said, they can tune the interaction between the cold atoms. And uh, so, for instance, even in the absence of interaction, just because they are quantum particles and uh, just because there are uh, interesting statistics to them, for example, for bosons, you can have bose einstein condensation even for non-interacting bosons. And similarly for fermions, also, you, because of the, even though there is no direct interaction between the fermions, because of the Pauli exclusion principle, which means that two fermions cannot be in the same quantum state. So this leads to a rich quantum many body physics, which can be directly probed by these experimental systems. And just to show you a picture, uh, okay, before that, so what is the typical setup with these experiments? Uh, that uh, they have these atoms uh, and uh, they put them in a laser trap, which is a confined, typically it's a harmonic trap, but they can do with uh, general potential, trapping potential V of X. And, uh, and they can do it in 1D, 2D, higher D, 3D, and also at uh, finite temperature or zero temperature. So what this trap does is to put these atoms in a confined region of, confine them in a, in a region of space. And so they are not, you know, translational invariant many body system. So they are, there's an inhomogeneity in the density. There'll be more uh, atoms near the trap center and less atoms near the edge. And just to show you a picture of the, uh, this thing. So these days, for example, this is uh, from the Greiner group at MIT. So th they can actually you know, construct what they call the quantum gas microscope. So these are the positions of 2D fermions in a harmonic trap in two dimension. And they can actually image the positions of the fermions. And uh, so you can actually study their fluctuations and so on. So this is the sort of uh, main, uh, main motivation of, of uh, this, uh, this work. So, so as I said, you know, the, the, this, if you look at the old, uh, typical atoms, it could be bosons or fermions. I'll be mostly talking about fermions. So, and here you see that near the trap center, if you, if this, if you are here, then uh, you won't see the curvature of the potential. So as a result, it behaves almost like a translational invariant system. And for this, you know, I mean, the traditional many body physics uh, you can find in standard books, uh, lots of nice properties of this translation, translational invariant uh, fermions or bosons, and uh, there are universal bulk properties. Uh, but what this trap does, and this is the sort of new physics, which is that it introduces an edge. And as I said, the, the, the density is no longer homogeneous. So it's homogeneous here, but then as you go away from the trap center, the density decreases and becomes zero at the two ends. Uh, these are called the edges. And, uh, and what happens is that there are new universal edge physics which emerges and which is not described by the traditional many body, uh, many body in, invariant physics specifically. Okay? And this is this, so what we have been studying for recent times is to, is to sort of explore the universal properties of the edge which is in, you know, induced by this trapping potential. Okay? And what we'll see is that as you, you know, if you take your uh, sub-interval minus L to plus L around the trap center, when L is of the order of the system, you know, interparticle distance, you are in the bulk, but when L becomes large, you are probing the edge regime, and then there's a spectacular crossover between the bulk and edge as you change your subsystem. Okay? And this is the crossover that we are going to uh, sort of focus on. Okay, so this is the problem. Okay? So let me just, you know, some of you may not be familiar with it, so it's very basic physics. So let me just remind you a little bit uh, just the background of this general setup at zero temperatures. We are dealing with this quantum system, and so what, what is the problem exactly? How do we set up the problem? So again, the system is, uh, so I have n free fermions at zero temperature in a confining trap V of x. So there is a ground state, which is uh, the many body state, psi zero, which is a pure state. And I want to look at the density matrix, which is a pure density matrix, psi zero, psi zero. And I want to consider any, any interval, for the moment in general, uh, some uh, sub interval A. And, uh, there are two objects. So first observable is the number variance that I want to calculate in the ground state. So let's say NA is the number of operators. It just counts how many fermions are there uh, inside this interval A. And as I said, because of quantum fluctuations, even at zero temperature, this number is not a fixed number. It fluctuates from sample to sample. And uh, so, so we would like to know this operator and you look at the variance of this operator in the ground state. Okay? So this is the number variance, that's the definition. And uh, entanglement entropy is, as I said, you know, you take your full density matrix psi zero, psi zero, and you trace out the A bar, which is the complement of A, and look at the reduced density matrix of subsystem A. And once we know that, 
then the trace of rho a to the power q log of that one more that this is the definition of Rainy entropy okay. and as I said q going to unlimited reduces to standard von Neumann entropy which is uh, log of rho uh, low, uh, trace of rho log of rho. Okay. So, so, this is the sort of these two objects are, they have been actually for this problem of fermions uh, they have been studied by several authors and I will come back to them as I uh, in recent times. And uh, so, so let us now focus on just non interacting fermion system. Okay. So, what is the general setup again? You have a V x here potential and uh, so, so the basically so if you look at first you have to solve the single particle problem single particle Schrodinger equation problem. So, I look at the Schrodinger equation of a single quantum particle and let us say these are the my uh, eigenfunctions phi k x and psi k uh, phi, sorry epsilon k are the single particle energy eigenvalues. And then once you have that single particle level, so these are the single particle levels with epsilon k denoting the energy levels. And then since they are non-interacting fermions, I can construct the many body ground state wave function, but just by just by taking the determinant, they are fermions. So, the probability that two particles will be at the same point will be 0. So, this you know the, the uh, recipe to construct the ground state many body wave function is to consider what is called the Slater determinant. That means, you take this first n uh, single particle eigenfunctions and you construct the determinant out of that. Okay. So, this is called the Slater determinant and this is the many body wave function of this uh, fermionic system. Okay. So, so, once I know this psi 0, then how do I calculate? Uh, so, so, okay, so you, you know psi 0 exactly. Now, how do you calculate the uh, number variance or the, or the uh, entanglement entropy from that? So, the standard uh, prescription for that, let me, I mean, I will not go into the details just to tell you the, just how it works. So, what you have to do, this just take it as a prescription because this is a very well known system. So, what you have to do is to take this uh, single particle wave function phi m star x phi n x dx and integrate over this sub interval a. Okay. So, this will be a matrix which is n by n matrix. So, this is called the overlap matrix. Okay. So, now if the subsystem a was the full space, then you see this is just a delta function m n that means it is an identity matrix. So, in which case the eigenvalues of this overlap matrix which are denoted by a i's, they will be all 1 exactly. Okay. But if this subsystem A is not the full space, but it's the subspace basically, so then of course these eigenvalues are not all. It's not an identity matrix. So the generally you have n eigenvalues, and these are denoted by A i's. They are real and they lie on all between zero and one. This is easy to prove. Okay. So once you have these eigenvalues, so then the number variance just is is just it. You can show it very easily. It's not difficult to show. It's just the trace of a minus a square which in terms of these eigenvalues is just sum over a i times 1 minus a i. Okay. So, if I know these eigenvalues of this overlap matrix and this is how people actually calculate it numerically. So, you, you, you construct your uh, single particle wave functions and then you just uh, you know diagonalize this matrix and you get these a i's and you just calculate a i times 1 minus a i sum over i equal to 1. This is the number variance. And similarly, Rainy entropy is just the trace log of this overlap matrix to the power q plus identity minus overlap matrix to the power q and in terms of these eigenvalues, this is just a log of a i to the power q 1 minus a i to the power q. Okay. So, you see immediately that there is no obvious direct relationship between the number variance and the entanglement entropy. Okay. I will come back to it later. Okay. So, this is the standard procedure. Okay. So, this is the this is how you do it numerically basically for instance. Okay. Now, there is another way of doing it which is uh, which uses uh, very nice property of this non-interacting fermions, which is called the uh, called the determinantal property. So let me just uh, tell you what that is. So you take this Slater determinant. So this is your ground state, exact ground state, and so the square of this is the quantum probability density. This is sort of tells you how the quantum fluctuations occur in the system. So you can you can in, this is this is a squared number and it's normalized to unity. So you can interpret this as a quantum PDF probability density function. So, this is just square of this. So, it is just determinant of phi i star x j, determinant of phi i x j, okay. which of course, you can write as a single determinant just by product of two determinants. And this single determinant is just the phi k star x single particle wave functions summed up to the Fermi level at 0 to n minus 1. And this is, uh, this is there is a name for it. This is called the kernel. Okay. So, what we see is that the joint probability density square or joint probability density which is psi mod square can be written as the determinant of a kernel 
Okay, very good. Now, what what does it help us? The thing is, there, there's a beautiful uh, determinantal property, as I said, it's called the determinantal point process, which says that if I now look at the m point correlation function of this my quantum system, x1, x2, xj, xm, which means basically I take the full probability density and I integrate over m plus 1 to n coordinates, keeping the first m fixed, okay, and then there's a combinatorial factor here. So this is defined as the m point correlation function, okay. And uh, so what happens is that, there, so this is, uh, we have seen that this object is just the determinant of this kernel. So we have to integrate this determinant kernel over m plus 1 to n coordinates and keeping the first n fixed. Now the magic thing is that uh, this object, this integral, you can show that this also becomes a determinant. Now it's a m by m determinant, so m point correlation function, this m is just m by m determinant. And the entries of this determinant, entries of this matrix are precisely the same kernel. Okay? So this is a non-trivial property, but this is a property of this determinantal point process. Okay? That is, uh, the m point correlation function can be written as a m by m determinant whose entries are exactly the same kernel. Okay? So this is, I mean, in physics, I mean, this is a direct consequence of what is called the Weeks theorem in Fermi and physics, but you can prove it mathematically. It's not uh, too difficult to prove. Okay? So therefore, the central object is this kernel. So, which is just the phi k star x phi k x, okay, physicists like to use this notation, but phi k star phi x k equal to 0 to n minus 1. So, if I know this kernel, then any m point correlation function I can write as a determinant of this, uh, this kernel, okay, which is just m by m determinant. So, for example, if I want to calculate the one point function, so this will be just 1, point one, one, one by 1 determinant, which is as the kernel itself. So, at the identical points, k n x x is just the density of this uh, fermionic pro problem. Okay, so this is beautiful. So, what is, but what does it help us to calculate the? How does it help us to calculate the main observables that we are interested? Number variance and entanglement entropy. In fact, I mean, okay. So you can. So this is this. This is this kernel I defined, and uh, you can actually define uh, a, a, what is called the restricted correlation function, which is just this kernel, but with x and y, they are both belonging to this subsystem A. Okay, so just put add and uh, you know some projection operator, which is indicator function. So that means k x y x and y are both between um, in it belongs to the sub interval a okay so then i can you know i, I can look at this so that you can think of this as an operator which is working in the functional space okay it's a, it's an infinite dimensional matrix if you like so it's on the functional space and its eigenvalues are eigenfunctions are psi lambda y and let's say eigenvalues are a lambda and uh, so this this is this is uh, so this object here is restricted to to the integral is over over y okay so i take this kernel and i just look at the eigen functions of this kernel uh, over this uh, inter sub interval a and uh, and then the spectrum of this operator kxy which is this a lambdas what you can show is that they are exactly same as the eigenvalues of the overlap matrix that i defined before okay, exactly same although the operators work in different spaces they have the same spectrum, exactly same spectrum. So as a result, number variance, which is the trace of overlap matrix A minus A square, which is also trace of this kernel Ka times I minus K. Okay? So it's, it's exactly, so this is just same, same eigenvalues. So therefore, either you can calculate by the overlap matrix or you can calculate by this uh, kernel Kxy. Okay? And similarly, any entropy is related to this. So this kernel will play an important role as I go along later. But these are the two alternate. So just to summarize, there are two alternate ways to calculate this. Either you uh, calculate the overlap matrix and calculate this of trace or this for the Randian entropy. Or alternatively, you uh, look, at the, uh, look at the kernel itself using the determin determinantal property. You look at the kernel itself and you calculate this, uh, this uh, trace of this kernel, k, k times i minus k or these objects. Okay? And since they have the same spectrum, it's exactly the same object. Okay? Sometimes this, this method is useful, sometimes this method is useful as we see later. Okay. Okay, so this is the sort of uh, general setup. Uh, so I mean, this is how you, know, you can do it for any arbitrary trap V of x and any interval, uh, any interval A. But let me now focus on harmonic trap Vx because there we can actually make some progress and uh, symmetric interval minus L2 plus L, okay. Okay, so, so now I have a harmonic trap Vx which is half m omega square x square. I'm at zero temperature, so I look at the density matrix which is the many body ground state wave function 
and I want to look at subsystem minus L to plus L. Okay. And as I said, number variance is uh, just this object here, and uh, similarly, entanglement entropy is just this object here. Okay. So this is the problem I'm focusing on now. So what the, and the question I want to ask is that as I vary, I keep n fixed number of fermions, and I vary this interval, sub interval uh, minus L, I vary L. Okay. So how does this number variance V and the entropy S, they vary with the interval size L for fixed <coughs> but large N. So that's the question I want to focus on. Okay. So, so again, this is the same question. So, so I want to change this L, you know, the interval size, and I want to see how, how these two objects vary with the system size L. Okay. So let me just uh, tell you first, this, has, this problem has been studied numerically. So this was uh, first paper, oops, sorry. First paper was by uh, Vicari in 2012. So what he's plotting here is this entanglement entropy, uh, sorry, this is number variance V. Forget about all these uh, numbers here. Just think of this variance and the x-axis here, this is just L, L over square root of n. It's scaling by square root of n. X is just L, L is the sub, sub interval size basically, okay? So what you see is a spectacular thing that the variance actually first increases and then it, it goes like that and then it, shook, it drops very, you know, dramatically around 1.4, okay? And this is the number variance for, for harmonic trap, and this is the same, but with a quartic potential V4X. Again, you see it increases, and then it drops. Okay. And also, you see that, you know, there's oscillations as you approach the drop here. Okay. So this is sort of quite spectacular. So as you change your sub-interval size L, so you see this non-monotonic effect, plus there are oscillations, and then it suddenly drops at, the, at uh, around 1.4. Same thing with, happens with the entanglement entropy, okay? And these numerically, they, are, they just o, do the o, you know, overlap matrix and calculate the eigenvalues and just uh, calculate these objects. Same thing you see for the entanglement entropy as a function of the system. Again, x is L over square root of n. This is x, I call it L. So as you change L, so it increases. It, so the, uh, the entanglement entropy increases and then again, it sort of decreases very rapidly at around the same point, 1.4. And you'll see the later that's 1.4 is just root 2. And, uh, and here the same thing, this is the Renyi entropy with a q equal to 2 and this is q equal to 1. Okay. So, so this is the sort of numerical observations. And so our main motivation at this point was to see if we can actually understand this analytically, this number variance as well as this entanglement entropy. And is there any relation between the two? And uh, so I just wanted to calculate this curve, okay, and, and understand what, why is these oscillations here at the, at the edge, okay. So, and what I want to show you is that there is an exact mapping to random matrix theory, as I said, using Gaussian Unitarian symbol between this fermion problem and the RMT problem. And, you know, in RMT, we are used to many beautiful techniques, uh, in particular these Coulomb gas techniques using saddle point for large n. And using these techniques from RMT and using this exploiting, this exact mapping to RM, the RMT problem, so we can actually calculate these curves analytically, okay, at least part of it. And that's the sort of main, uh, main, main, main result, okay. So let me just uh, summarize the result before I get, get into any technical details. So the main summary of the results is the following. So here again, I plot the first the number variance as a function of this L, but uh, you know, you'll see that there's a natural scaling, which is the L over square root of N. So N is fixed, but large, and I, x-axis is just, just this, uh, you know, interval size L, L over root N, I call it zeta, and I set this, all these quantum parameters, same omega h bar to be one. So again, in, on this scale, if you plot the variance, what you see is that it it's the same curve, uh, just plotted in a different distance. You see it increases these things, and then shoo, it drops. And if you zoom out this edge region, you see that, that it actually has oscillations and it goes to zero, uh, you know, it oscillates and goes to zero. Okay? So this is the curve that we want to understand. Uh, and these red dots are the numerical results. And uh, so the main result is that what we find is that the, the variance is actually given by, so if I'm in this regime here, in this whole regime, okay? So that means when zeta is much less than root two, so root two is here basically. So zeta is less than root two, but much bigger than order one over n, which is the typical interparticle spacing. Then the variance has one over pi square log of n zeta 
times this factor here, 2 minus zeta square to the power 3 over 2. So this, this result is valid over this full range here. Okay. But it breaks down in this edge regime. So when I'm edge regime, that is when I'm setting my zeta to be very close to the edge, root 2 plus order n to the power minus 2 third, and this s uh, denotes the fluctuation, I mean the distance from root 2 from the edge. So if I scale it like this, then the variance can be written as some function of just the scale distance s. Okay, and I, we can compute this function exactly. And then when zeta is much bigger than root 2, that is you are beyond this edge, you know, in this, this regime here, there it decays like e to the power minus 2n times some function phi of zeta, which again, this is a large deviation function, which you can compute exactly also. So just to tell you what are these two functions, so, yeah, so these two functions can be computed exactly. And uh, so let just to tell you, so the fu function v2x, v2s, you remember this is the edge scaling function, the oscillation part basically. So this function is given uh, uh, by this integral here, where k a i uh, is called the uh, airy kernel. So it's just a normal airy function, and you, you construct this uh, this object. So this is the called the airy kernel, and is given exactly by this integral. So you can calculate its asymptotic properties. So when s goes to minus infinity, it goes like log mod s, and when s goes to infinity, it goes like exponential minus four third of s to the power three by two, and in between it oscillates because the airy function oscillates also. And beyond edge, that is, if I go further to the right of the edge, when zeta is bigger than root 2, then there's this large division function, which also we can cal calculate explicitly. So this is just a summary of the uh, summary of the main result. And how about the entanglement entropy? So entanglement entropy similarly. So we can calculate again this regime here, which is the uh, sort of big bulk regime beyond, you know, much less than edge. So here you find that exactly same behavior as number variance. This log factor is exactly identical, except that there's a prefactor here, which is 1, 6 times 1 plus 1 over q. Now, if you are in this oscillatory regime at the edge, so there we cannot calculate anything. We know this will be some function of s, but you know, this is, we cannot calculate. So this is open problem. And uh, then beyond zeta bigger than root 2, so there it goes like again with the same large division function with the factor 2 and there's some prefactor here and this uh, phi of xi. And okay, there is an additional constant here which you could compute, non-trivial constant, and this is also was calculated in a different context in the fermionic system called it's known as the gene corepin constant. Okay. So this is the main summary of the results. So basically we can understand now fully analytically this part of the curve. We can understand this part of the curve. For entanglement entropy, we do not understand this uh, oscillation part, but for the number variance, we are able to uh, we are able to understand, we are able to compute this oscillatory part here. Okay. So this is the sort of main summary of the results. So let me now get to tell you how we derive these results. Okay. So, so first I want to you know, just uh, talk about the, uh, the mapping to random matrix theory, how it works. And uh, so it's actually very nice, uh, very nice mapping. So all you do is, you know, this is first let's look at a single particle in a harmonic trap. So everybody knows this is basic quantum mechanics. So you just solve your single particle uh, Schrodinger equation to get the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So eigenfunctions are just Gaussian times Hermit polynomials with energy levels k plus half h bar omega, k equal to 0, 1, 2, 3. This is all of us know. And this alpha here is uh, just square root of m omega by h bar. m omega is this potential and h bar is the, just this quantum h bar. And these uh, HKs are the Hermit polynomials. Okay, so we have this uh, single particle wave functions exactly you know. So now I want to construct the many body wave, many body ground state wave function by taking the first n uh, single particle states and constructing the determinant out of that, right? So this is the many body wave function, slater determinant. So, so I just have to put the Hermit polynomial times Gaussian inside this phi of xj and calculate this determinant. So the Gaussian factor has just come out. So you just have to calculate the determinant of Hermit polynomials. And the determinant of Hermit polynomial, or for that matter any polynomial, you can explicitly evaluate. And this is very simple because just to give you an example, so suppose I take n equal to 3 and I look at these three Hermit polynomials, I want to calculate this determinant. Okay. So this is just the determinant of that. And you immediately see that by just multiplying this row by 2 and adding to this and taking out all the numerical factors, you can easily reduce it to a van der Mond form. Okay? So determinant of this, which is just uh, just, just van der Mond. Okay? 
and this you can repeat for any n. So, in fact, for any n, the determinant of any orthogonal polynomial is always going to be just the Van der Mond determinant. Okay? So, once you have that, then you have the explicitly the ground state many body wave function, which is just this Gaussian times a Van der Mond. Okay? So, if I now square it, which is my quantum many body PDF, quantum PDF, so this is just the square of this, so it's just Van der Mond square. But, you know, I mean, when you look at this, and this is just normalization constant, partition function. When you look at this, this is just exactly the joint distribution of the eigenvalues of a Gaussian unitary ensemble. For those of you who are not familiar with random matrix, just to, just to remind you, so if you take an n by n uh, Gaussian random matrix, okay, so Ji, Ji call it, so the distribution of the entries, so they are independent Gaussians, and I choose the variance such that I can write down the probability distribution of the entries as exponential minus sum over Gij mod square. Okay, so these Gij's are complex, so this is a complex Hermitian matrix, let's say. So this you can write down as a trace of J dagger J. So you can see that it's invariant under a rotation by unitary uh, transformation. So that's why it's called the Gaussian unitary ensemble. So given this joint distribution of entries, if you ask what's the distribution of the eigenvalues, okay, so this is a non-trivial problem. Uh, but this is well known. So this has n real eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda n. And you ask, what is the joint distribution of the eigenvalues? Okay. And this is a well-known result from uh, RMT, that joint distribution of eigenvalues is given by exactly this factor here, exponential minus lambda i square. But then there's an additional factor which comes in, which is because, I mean, the way you solve it, you actually go from the entries of the matrix, you know, which, is, you know, which has a number of degrees of freedom, and you go into eigenvalues and eigenvector degrees of freedom, make a change of variables. And then you integrate out the eigenvector vector degrees of freedom to calculate the marginal joint distribution of the eigenvalues. And in making this change of variables, there is a Jacobian factor. And this factor here is precisely this Jacobian factor. So there is no physical uh, meaning to it here. It's just a you know, mathematical transformation which gives rise to this. And this is responsible for the eigenvalue repulsion. You see the probability that two eigenvalues are next to each other goes to zero, basically. Okay? So you cannot have two eigenvalues next to each other. And uh, so, so this is the famous eigenvalue repulsion in random matrix theory. And this is a well-known result. The joint distribution is, is given by this. Okay? So what you see now here is these two problems. So GU eigenvalues joint distribution is given by this. Whereas here, for our fermion problem, the ground state many body wave function mod square, the quantum fluctuation, quantum PDF, if you like, is exactly given by the same, same relation with a, just a alpha. Uh, length scale, if you uh, call alpha times xi, as so in law, this, this object is exactly equivalent in law to the joint distribution of the eigenvalues of the uh, Gaussian random matrix, unitary random matrix. Okay? But here you see that this is, uh, this factor here, it came from the Pauli exclusion principle, right? Because you came from the, the uh, quantum many body wave function, and because two fermions cannot be in the same place, so that's why you get this factor here, which comes out of the Slater determinant. So there's a physical origin. This is exactly direct consequence of the Pauli exclusion principle. Here it was a different physical, I mean, it was a, just a Jacobian transformation. But you, within the fermion picture, you actually see uh, where this repulsion comes from, where this, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the repulsion comes from. It's a direct consequence of Pauli exclusion principle, okay? So this is the mapping. So therefore, I mean, you know, the, the, the ground state properties of this n fermionic system, the positions of the fermions, any observable, I can relate directly to the uh, random matrix observables. And therefore, I mean, if I know how to calculate this in the random matrix theory, I can calculate it for fermions. Okay? So this, this is the main point. So for instance, okay, if you look at the average density of states, we know from RMT, the, so the average density of fermions is exactly the same as the average density of uh, the eigenvalues of, uh, of this uh, GUE matrix. And it's well known that, uh, that you know, if you scale it by root n, then uh, the density is given by this weakness semicircular form. The scaling function is 1 over pi square root of 2 minus z square in the scaled units. So there, with this finite support minus root 2 plus root 2, because uh, you know, this, is, this is where the trap is trying to push the particles towards the center, and, uh, the, and the, uh, the, the, the Gaussian, uh, you know, the, the, the repulsion is trying to push them apart. So they settle down into a uh, weakness semicircular form. And, uh, and you can also calculate the average, you know, the interparticle distance between the particles, okay, between the eigenvalues, if you like. So this is near the, so there are two regimes. So in the bulk, near the trap center, 
So you can just, you know, you can estimate it very easily by setting the density integrate from 0 to L bulk and set it to be a water 1 over N. This is the, de, de, you know, this is just a normalized to unity. So it's a fraction of eigenvalues between x and x plus dx. And from this you can easily estimate that the bulk is n to the power minus half. And similarly, edge is given by n to the power minus 1 sixth. And so L edge is much bigger than L, L bulk. Okay, so the, because the density is going down, so the distance between the particles is becoming bigger and bigger as you approach the edge. Okay. And uh, furthermore, you can actually analyze the, the, uh, the kernel that I mentioned, KNXY. So in the bulk, it has this so-called sine kernel form. So I'll go rapidly a little bit here. Sine kernel form, and you can, you can uh, calculate at the edge, when you are at the edge. So there it has a scaling form, where this, uh, this kernel is called the airy kernel at that edge. Okay. And this is universal with respect to the trap form. Okay, so this is very good. So now let me just show you how to just last five minutes. So how do I calculate this number variance using RMT connection? So, so the idea is that, again, I want to calculate the number number of fermions in the interval minus L to plus L, which is exactly the number of eigenvalues in the interval minus L to plus L. Okay? So the average is very easy to compute. So the average is just n times rho n x dx, and rho n x is this uh, Wigner semicircular form. So average you can calculate very easily. Okay? Now I want to calculate the variance. And uh, so variance, again, since I know the kernel, so, so there is an exact formula for this variance, minus L to plus L. Okay? But the problem is that this kernel, okay, you have a formal formula, but uh, you know, you have to, we want to analyze the L dependence. So it's not easy because this kernel is, you know, it involves this many body wave, you know, it involves this single particle sum wave function. So to get a formula out of this is not so easy. But, uh, but you can analyze this very easily in the two regime, bulk regime and the edge regime, okay, using the scaling form of these uh, kernels. Okay. So let's see how it works. So if I'm in the bulk, that is if my L is of order 1 over square root of an interparticle distance, and if I'm at the edge, so these are the two limits that you can easily analyze by knowing the form of the kernel there. Okay. So I'll go quickly. Uh, so if you analyze in the bulk, if L is between minus L to plus L, then, uh, then you can uh, calculate the variance using the sine kernel form of the kernel, and you get this, this is a classic old result by, derived by many people, Dyson Mehta and then Kostin Leboic. So you get, this is the regime when L is of order 1 over root n, okay? And uh, so this is, the, this is the classic random matrix result, which you can directly transport to the fermions. But we are interested in when L is much larger than order 1 over root n, okay? And similarly, okay, so other limit is the edge. So if I calculate the edge limit, again, by, by plugging in this form of this kernel in the formula, you can actually compute this, uh, this, uh, this scaling function when, when L is of the order of the system size. So basically what you see, why is it dropping the variance? Because you know, it's, the system is sitting in a semicircular form. So if, the, if your system size subinterval is L is much bigger than the root, root 2, then essentially it, it, goes, to, uh, you know, it goes to 0. Okay. okay, so these are the two limits. Uh, and now we want to calculate, you know, as I vary L from the bulk regime to the edge regime. How do I calculate this? Okay, so okay, this is a little bit too long, so I'll just very quickly just to tell you. So basically, main idea is to compute the uh, using uh, you know the Coulomb gas method. So you have the joint distribution of the positions of the eigenvalues, and what you want to calculate is uh, just the number of uh, distribution of the number of particles inside this subinterval L. Okay, so this is just an indicator function. So once you have this, so this is. So you can think of this as a Coulomb gas, uh, you know, with a logarithmic repulsion and there's a co confining potential. And you have this additional constraint that you just fix the number of particles between minus L to plus L. Okay? So this Coulomb gas techniques, there are many ways to compute this. And uh, I won't go into the details, but what we can show is that the full probability distribution of the number of particles in A, you can write in this large division form, n square of some uh, rate function, which depends on this fraction of particles uh, between this between this in this interval and this this function we can compute explicitly exactly so this is this paper here and uh, so if you plot this uh, rate function it looks like this it has a quadratic minimum and uh, and just by looking at the minimum you, around this quadratic minimum you can read off the variance from this and this is how we calculate the variance okay? and what you can find is that this goes like log z n zeta times this additional factor 2 minus zeta square over 3 by 2. Okay? 
and in the bulk limit when zeta is much less than root 2 you get back the Dyson Mehta result. So just to summarize again, so this is the this is the sort of main uh, main result. So we have this. So this this whole regime we can get from the Coulomb gas, and uh, this age regime we can get from the directly from the scaling from the kernel, and then this is another large deviation result which you can obtain. But I will not go into the details. So how much time do you have? Five minutes. Um, five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. So let me just uh, briefly mention the same. Uh, uh, how do we calculate the Rene entropy? So Rene entropy, you know. So how do I calculate Rene entropy? So the point is that, I mean, as I told you that using the RMT connection, you can calculate the full distribution of the number of particles A between minus L to plus L. Okay? How does that help to calculate uh, the Rene entropy? So what you can do, so once you know this, so you can calculate this generating function, 1 minus Z to the power Na. So this is a cumulative generating function because this is this object. If I know this, I know this. Okay? How does that help me? So the point is that Rene entropy is, is this object here. Okay? And so to compute the SQ, so we need to know the overlap eigenvalues AIs. Okay? Now, so to calculate the overlap eigenvalues, it's useful to look at the, the characteristic polynomial of this guy, lambda minus AI, this product here. Okay? So if I know this, I know the eigenvalues AIs, and from this I can calculate Rene entropy. Now this object here, you can actually relate to, I mean, this I'm not showing you the result, but what we have shown is to uh, that this uh, characteristic polynomial of the eigenvalues of the overlap matrix, you can relate directly to the cumulant generating function of the number of particles uh, in this subinterval A. So, th so this we know from Coulomb gas result. So therefore, we can calculate this, and therefore we can calculate this. Uh, this characteristic polynomial. And once we know this characteristic polynomial, then we can calculate the Rene entropy from that. Okay, so that's the idea. So this is the exact formula we have. So this is the Rene entropy, which is related to the cumulant generating function of Na. Okay? And okay, so you have this complex integral in the complex lambda plane. And uh, okay, I, I'm not showing you these results, but this is fairly sim simple to derive this result. And uh, once you have that, then so then you have to analyze this basically, and uh, so if, if it turns out that if the you know if the number of particles Na is a purely Gaussian variable, which it is not, but suppose that it is a purely Gaussian variable, then you can actually do this integral exactly, and you can show that the Rene entropy is just just proportional to the uh, number variance with a proportionality factor, which is uh, pi square over six one plus one over cube. But and, and, the, and the point is that P of Na, as we saw from the large division form, that it is a Gaussian near its mean. So this actually gives us the leading order result for the entropy. Okay? So the leading order result for the entropy is this, uh, this factor here. So this is this part. Okay? So log of n zeta 2 minus zeta square to the 3 by 2. And we can also calculate this edge here, but we cannot calculate this, uh, unfortunately. This, because here, the, you know, the, the, the Na is certainly not Gaussian. So as a result, non-Gaussian fluctuations, fluctuations come in. So for number variance, we can calculate this, but for any, any entropy, we, we cannot calculate this. So this is a totally open problem. And um, okay, so let me just uh, summarize and conclude. So, so basically, you know, so I've, I've talked about a very, very simple system, a many-body system, which is a non-interacting fermions in a harmonic trap at zero temperature. Okay. And uh, what you have shown is that the eigenvalues of the GV, these are the, these positions of the fermions, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence, the quantum fluctuations of that is one-to-one -one correspondence to the joint distribution of the eigenvalues of a Gaussian unitary ensemble uh, in random matrix theory. And exploiting this connection, we are able to compute the uh, number variance as well as, uh, we are actually exploiting this, I mean, for the for the full distribution of the number of particles in the subinterval A, we can calculate using the RMT correction, Coulomb gas and saddle point method. And from that, we can calculate the number variance and Rene entropy for, for large n, but for fixed n. And we, we have explored the three regimes, bulk, edge, and the crossover between the bulk. And you see the spectacular uh, crossover. This is the summary. So the related issues are, you know, if you take the subinterval A to be from zero to infinity, then the number of fermions in the, in the half space is exactly the same as the index, which is the number of positive eigenvalues of GV. And so for that, many results are known. So we can, again, you know, make the connection between these two 
and direct, directly lift the results from RMT. And the next important question is that so far I've been talking about a zero temperature, but you can ask what happens at finite temperature. So I didn't have time to talk about that. So there's some recent work uh, with uh, Aurelia Grabs, who's a PhD student, and uh, Christophe Texier and Gregory Scher. So we are able to make some progress on this, but it's still work on progress. And, uh, and then you can ask what happens to the number variance and integral entropy in higher dimensions at finite temperature. So for this, we still, this is still an open problem. So we have recently, uh, you know, uh, we have been able to com compute some correlation functions of fermions at finite temperature and higher d. So perhaps hopefully these results will be useful for this, uh, for this calculation of the number variance and integral entropy. And uh, finally, just to show you a picture in 2D, for example. So in 1D, you have seen that the fermion density is just given by Wigner's semicircular law. So in 2D, so here is this uh, picture. This is a simulation result, and we have analytical results for this. So you see that uh, this is n equal to 28 fermions, and this is a large n limit. So it just becomes a cap in 2D. And uh, so you can ask the same question again. That is, if I take any little uh, circle here and ask how many, uh, how many fermions are there, what is the variance, what's the entanglement entropy of that with the rest of the system. And you would expect a similar sort of interesting spectacular uh, um, bulk to edge crossover as you, as you increase your radius of your subsystem. Okay? So that's an interesting open problem. So thank you very much for your attention. So we have time for a few quick questions before the coffee break. Excitation since what we have been looking at is, is at finite temperature, for example. When you increase the temperature, you have to look at the excited states, essentially. And uh, so there, you know, this determinantal structure still persists, okay. So basically what you have to do is to, uh, so ground state is basically, you know, you occupy uh, just the first n levels. But any excited state, you can label this by these occupation numbers, right? So, so nk. So these nk's are either zero or one. Okay. So instead of these things, I can take, for example, uh, just move one uh, electron from here to there, basically. Okay. So, so I can I can uh, write. I mean, I can I can give you a set of nk's, okay? And the the set of nk's which are one. That means you have to take those wave functions to construct your slater determinant out of that. And if you do that, and then you find that, uh, you know, that uh, again, you can, for that particular set, excited state, you can still uh, write down this kernel. That means you can uh, calculate the, you know, corresponding to that particular set, the quantum many body wave function. So this is again given by a determinant of this kernel which now depends on this n case okay, of x, y. And this kernel has a very simple form, okay, which is just n k phi k star x phi k y, sum over all k. So ground state corresponds to just choosing the first uh, one of them, one, 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 up to n minus one. But if you take any excited state, you can always write down this way, kernel, okay. And then, uh, so, so basically all you have to do incorporate now is this, uh, you know, the, the statistics of this nk's, which is uh, just a Fermi function. And uh, so from that you can actually compute uh, some of these things. Uh, so. Okay, other questions? Well, then let's thank Satya again.